In this video, I'm going to be making a stunning shaker table completed with a veneer top, dovetail drawer and hand cut joinery, which in many ways completely undermines everything the shaker movement stood for. But I'm a YouTube woodworker, so what better do I know? All right, so I'm looking for three things at this stage, grain pattern, color match and defects. In the case of the legs, I'm specifically looking for rift sawn patterns where the grain runs at 45 degrees on the end grain, which creates straight grained patterns on all four faces. Whereas through sawn legs create a straight grain pattern on one face and a crown cut on another, which doesn't provide the consistency I'm looking for. There's certain ways we can orient these legs so that these defects naturally get removed when it comes to planing the tapers into them. And so that's gonna be on the inside faces. When it comes to grain patterns and color matching, I think this is one of those areas that's very easily overlooked while making and taken for granted when a piece is finished. As an example, if I pay attention to material selection, hopefully this will just look like a table made from walnut, as it should. But if I weren't to take material selection into account at this stage, all of a sudden it becomes a table made of walnut, but with a really shitty <laughs> leg. And in fact, I had a component that was at risk of this, but fortunately was able to hide it at the back. Look at that, it's just, yeah, absolute rubbish that. With regards to the sides, these have been cut from one board so we can get a continuous grain wrap around the outside of the table. So by this point I'm content with my orientations, so I'm going to begin marking out which component goes into which. I plan on joining this table with mortise and tenons, and so I set up a mortise gauge that would allow me to mark both sides of the tenon cheeks at once. Then using this thing called a shaft clamp, I'm going to adjust the offset of the gauge without changing the width of the cutters, which will allow me to mark the mortises onto the legs at the exact same width as the tenon, but with a 5mm offset that will create a step in the finished joint. As for the front rails, I've got two different joints going on here. A stub mortise and tenon for the lower rail and a lapsed dovetail for the top rail, which is gonna be cut at a one in six ratio. And so with all the layout now done, let me just share a quick tip for you when it comes to cutting mortises. Now I'm very fortunate in that this bench is five inches thereabouts thick. And so for me, I could place this anywhere I want in the bench and get pretty good support from underneath. That said, I want you to listen to this. Can you hear this difference in sound it makes when I'm above the leg in the workbench? Even in a workbench five inches thick, that sound is so drastically different in this area. If I place this mortise that I'm chopping above the leg in the workbench, I am gonna get much better power transfer than if I were to be placing it out here. Additionally, I'm gonna position myself so that I can look down the length of the mortise to ensure that I'm cutting plumb, because looking from the side could easily result in undercorrecting or overcorrecting the chisel's descent. If you want to learn more about this process, it's all covered in part two of the Shaker Table series on my free online woodworking school, where each step of this build is broken down into much finer detail. And so should you wanna build this yourself, it's there, completely free to watch. Anyway, these back legs include two mortises that meet in the bottom. And so while chopping the second mortise, I'm gonna insert a scrap piece of wood to support the inner layers and prevent them from breaking out and loosening the fit of the tenon. And so with the mortises done, next I'm gonna move on to the tenons. For this, I'm going to be using, would you believe, a tenon saw. This one is made by Lee Nielsen and is an absolute monster of a saw, but a Japanese Ryoba saw would be a slightly more cost-effective solution and gives you the benefit of having a rip cut and a cross cut in one tool. As you can see, there is a certain technique to this that we'll gloss over here, but now you know where you can find this information should you want to learn a little bit more. So we've got about a millimeter we need to pair off of these faces. Oh, shit, that never happened. We've got about a millimeter we need to pair off of these faces with a chisel. The problem with doing this is that the fibers we're removing are technically still attached to the end grain here. So what makes more sense here is to actually chisel down this shoulder line first, which is gonna cut the fibers along the tenon. So then when it comes to pairing across here, they just, peel up effortlessly. As I'm planning on using a water-based glue to assemble these joints, I'm gonna go for a fit that includes some element of friction, but not so much that it requires some serious force to assemble, because this glue is gonna swell the fibers somewhat and may potentially make it impossible to assemble. 
Now the mortise for the front rail needs to be situated very carefully because any slight misalignment will end up creating issues when it comes to fitting the drawer later on. The top rail on the other hand is just a simple lap dovetail that you've seen me cut hundreds of times on this channel. Simply cut the tail, chisel back the shoulder lines, use a marking knife to transfer the tail to the socket and then use whatever tools you have at your disposal to get it to fit perfectly. Hey, bloody hell, that's actually one of the best I've done. God, I'm having a good day today. If you want to buy one of these marking knives, I sell them on my website. I make them all myself. It's got a fully replaceable blade, nice little thumb hold on there. And if you flip the blade upside down, it works for right-handers as well. In addition to this knife, I've listed everything I'm using in this video in the description below. I only use the best quality tools available to me, which by the way, don't always need to be the most expensive. And also if you choose to purchase any of them after clicking on one of my links, I'll get a small commission at no extra cost to you, which is a great way of ensuring these videos keep coming. While while also getting a shiny new tool in the process. The other thing I need to do is make some draw runners for the inside of the table where I'm going to be using two techniques to secure them in place. So the lower draw runners are going to be simply screwed and glued in place while ensuring that they're perfectly flush with the two front rails. The top runner however is going to be attached with bolts and threaded inserts as it will allow me to adjust the fit of the drawer should it expand and bind itself in position at a later date or perhaps more likely I balls it up completely and accidentally make it too loose. Now I've always really liked threaded inserts and feel like they get a really bad rep these days which I blame solely on this video. Thanks for that Suman, but you ain't stopping me. However, to stack the opposition against me even more was also recently backed up by Keith who had this experience while making a cot for his newborn. Yeah, all right, look, okay, they, they might be a problem child from time to time, but much like a reluctant yet supportive parent, I remain loyal to these little things. So next we're going to focus on sanding and actually pre-finishing the inside faces of this table. Insides of the legs, inside of these side rails. And I think personally for a lot of this, I'm just going to use a really finely set plane. Then maybe a few strokes with 240 and call it there. The great thing about designs like this is that they can be glued up in stages. The first stage being the two sides of the table. And here I'm using winding sticks to accentuate any twists that may be present and fixing them accordingly before being glued in position. With the two sides assembled, they can effectively become the bread in this shaker table sandwich I'm creating with the back rail and the front rail acting as the filling. And now I've got my wooden sandwich assembled, I can move on to the veneer top. For this table, I plan on applying a four-way bookmatched walnut burr veneer. The problem with these burr veneers is that they tend to buckle and distort, which makes them almost impossible to join seamlessly. So before creating the book match, I'm going to apply this special flattening solution that if you want to know more about, is detailed in part 12 of the long form series on the free online woodworking school. But we'll revisit that later once it's dried, because next I need to begin working on the drawer by dimensioning all of the components to their finished size and lay out as much of the joinery as I possibly can before cutting. Traditional drawer construction can be very tricky tricky to get your head around and it still trips me up from time to time if I'm honest. What's special about this design is it includes lap dovetails on the front, through dovetails on the back and has a solid bottom that can be removed and replaced even after the drawer is fully assembled. Now the drawer's fitted, I'm going to see what the result of this veneer flattening process is and begin laying them out in various orientations to see what patterns I can create. And I think I'm going to settle for the layout that creates this cool sapwood star in the middle. I've gone through countless trials and tribulations with veneer tape over the years and have lots to say on the matter, but I can assure you with absolute certainty that you do not want to use masking tape when holding veneer together because the pressure of the clamps will literally squeeze all of the adhesive out of the tape and into the grain, which makes it a ball ache to remove. If you've watched my videos for a while, you may remember me doing some veneering in one of my earlier projects where I used a water activated tape. This is what's commonly used as veneer tape, but I have a bit of a love-hate relationship with the stuff because while it works for veneers that like to behave and stay flat, when it comes to burrs, you're just asking for the water to swell and distort the joint, which brings you back to square one. Hence why I'm using this yellow stuff instead. 
And what we're left with is a raw MDF edge that we need to stick something to, to both hide the MDF and protect this edge of veneer from getting damaged and peeling up. To hide the MDF edge, I'm gonna be using solid wood lipping with miters on all four corners. While edge banding has its place in fitted furniture, solid wood is much less prone to damage and will give me more scope for applying edge profiles such as chamfers later on. By the way, quick tip for you. If you ever cut the mitres slightly too short, just plane the inside face a couple of times because what this will do is magically expand the distance between these two mitres and get you the fit you're looking for. And for alignment and a little bit of strength, I'm just gonna plunge a few dominoes into the side of the lipping to help stop it sliding around too much when glue is applied. But when it comes to plunging into the veneer top, however, I'm going to apply a couple of layers of masking tape to the domino fence, which will result in the lipping sitting ever so slightly proud when the glue is dry, which will give me a bit of scope to plane it flush while maintaining the veneer at its maximum thickness. So with the lipping all flushed off, we start to get a good idea as to what the final top will look like. But what I reckon this thing is missing is inlay. I'm cutting this inlay line with a router, but it's going to require two slightly offset passes to account for variance in the inlay's thickness. I could then mitre each corner of the inlay, glue it in position, and give it a light sand with a hard sanding block, which will both make the inlay flush with the surface below, and the dust will hopefully fill any small gaps that may have been present. Finally, I'm going to screw threaded inserts into the underside of the top and plane a chamfer into the bottom of the lipping, which makes it look lovely and elegant. And now all that's required is a quick sand, a little bit of finish and a few bolts. And with that, the table is complete. But before you go, here's a little bit of exciting news for you. We're now stocking pre-machined project packs for this table, as well as all of the previous projects we've taught on the free online woodworking school. So if you want to make this yourself, there's a link to our store below, or at the very least, if you're just interested in understanding more about what it takes to actually make this project, go and check out the series on the free online woodworking school. And while you're there, you can grab the free digital plans from my website as well. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please don't forget to press the like button, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you in the next one.